Joining us now on the line from New Haven, Connecticut, Jacob Hacker. He's professor of political science at Yale University and the author of Winner Take All Politics, How Washington Made the Rich Richer and Turned Its Back on the Middle Class. Jacob, it's good to have you on the program. How are you tonight? I'm well. Thanks for having me on. Not at all. Can you explain for those of our viewers who may not be following the events in Wisconsin as clearly or as carefully as you in the United States are, what's the gist of this dispute about? Well, on the surface, this dispute is really about the collective bargaining rights of workers within Wisconsin, public sector workers in Wisconsin. And because actually the governor, uh, Scott Walker, uh, exempted some public sector workers from the change that he was proposing, we're really talking here about public sector workers besides firefighters and policemen um, who are uh, basically facing a, a big shift in their collective bargaining rights within the state. Uh, the governor wants to take away their ability to bargain uh, for anything but wage increases, and he wants to limit those wage increases uh, to just uh, the cost of living increases within the state. From the government's uh, standpoint, is this about anything more than just trying to save some money? Oh, it's actually a lot more than about saving money. As, as I said, on the surface, this is really about benefits and pay and collective bargaining, but really it's, it's a much deeper battle in Wisconsin, and that's why we've seen so many people turn out. It's really about what's the place of unions in the 21st century economy. And, you know, in the United States, private sector unions have lost enormous ground. Um, they now represent only around eight, 7 to 8 percent of the private sector workforce. Uh, in the public sector, unions still have a place, but it's, it's not that large. It's about a third of the public sector workforce, and it hasn't declined as much. So really, the public sector unions are the last bulwark of unions within uh, the American economy, and a lot of uh, conservatives uh, and Republicans don't want unions to be a big presence in American uh, economic life, and they'd like to cut them back further. Now, I know at one point in this whole dispute, uh, the governor, who's a Republican, tried to get his program through, but the Democrats in the assembly left the state so that they couldn't have a quorum, I guess, in order to bring this forward for a vote. Have they resolved any of that yet? And where is this at tonight, so to speak? Well, actually, the, the bill was passed. Um, it was passed um, without the Senate Democrats present. And I'll come to the details of that in a moment. But just so you know, the, the Senate Democrats left because they feared that there wasn't going to be a, a full discussion of the bill. And they were preventing there being a quorum uh, in the uh, in the Senate in the Wisconsin Senate, and by by leaving town, basically they were holding up the process and hoping that they would raise enough concern, uh, there'd be a broad enough outrage that the governor would be forced to reconsider his proposal. Um, as it happened, uh, as I mentioned before, in the end, the governor was able to get the the changes through uh, the Senate uh, by basically taking out some features of it of his changes that were budget related and basically putting it through without the Senate Democrats because the quorum wasn't required if he took out those budget related features. So it's all very complex parliamentary maneuvering. But the bottom line is that the governor basically did never back down from his basic goal of saying that there should be no collective bargaining rights beyond this very minimal uh, wage bargaining. And, and, and he succeeded in that regard in terms of passing the legislation uh, in Wisconsin. So if I can pick up then on the title of your book, The Governor Won. And you have talked about the emergence of this winner-take-all politics in America. What do you mean by that specifically? Well, we don't know if the governor's won the larger war. You know, the battle here was about this particular bill. The larger war is about whether or not there are protections for the middle class and uh, and whether or not unions will continue to play a role in American politics and American and the American economy. And you know, what we write about in the book, my co-author Paul Pearson and I, is the extent to which in the United States the broad middle class has lost ground relative to the richest of Americans who have seen their incomes and their political influence skyrocket. So one of the interesting features of this debate that took place in Wisconsin is it's one of the first times in recent memory that we've really had a broad discussion of the place of organized labor in American public and economic life. And I think it showcased to many Americans that the attacks on unions were about more than just the budget, but had something to do with the place that unions have in securing middle class incomes and standard of living. Because if you look at the polls, over the course of that debate, the governor became much less popular. His policy changes became much less popular. And across 
the rest of the country, there was a broad reaction against this as moving too far in the direction of, of taking away rights uh, and, and influence from ordinary workers. So amplify that a bit if you would. How do you think this winner-takes-all attitude and winner-takes-all politics affects the middle class in America today? Well, winner-take-all politics is basically a reflection of the fact that people, uh, that people who have gained so much in the last generation in the United States, the very richest of Americans, the top 1% of the income distribution, the top one-tenth of 1%, have been able to translate a lot of that political influence, uh, a lot of that economic uh, uh, gain, those economic gains into political influence. And I think there's a broad sense right now that the balance has shifted too far, um, in, both in the sense that uh, Americans f are worried about the degree to which those at the top are not um, suffering to the same degree that middle class and working class Americans are in this current downturn, and in the sense that they feel that lobbyists and special interests and corporate uh, corporate uh, interests have much too much influence in the process of, of governance. And so that, to my mind, that's what this big debate that we've just had kind of showcased for many Americans is that there is a real battle taking place uh, about the future of the American dream. And th there's a sense in which uh, many people are worried that the Republican Party, that conservatives uh, are trying to push back against the sort of broad common ground of agreement that once existed that we need to have organized labor, that we hate, need to have sort of basic middle class protections as a healthy part of a capitalist economy. Okay, then Jacob, help us with this. If winner-take-all politics negatively or adversely affects the middle class, why do very large numbers of middle class Americans still continue to vote for winner-take-all politicians? Well, I mean, in 2010, the fall of 2010, we saw a lot of Americans vote for, for the Republican Party, but most political scientists who've looked at this believe that it's mostly a reflection of the fact that it was such a poor economy and that there was dissatisfaction with the direction of the country. I mean, if you look at the polls, uh, Americans say that they are concerned about um, the, the continuing high rates of unemployment, that they don't feel that the middle class is getting a fair shake or fair representation in Washington. They don't think that the deficit should be the number one priority. Uh, and perhaps most important, that they think that a lot of the big goodies given to those at the top, like tax cuts for the rich, shouldn't be allowed to continue. Uh, what's really striking is that political leaders uh, largely have been ignoring those sentiments. And in a political contest in which you have a lot of confusion about what policies mean and, and, and a lot of uh, uh, acrimony and, and anger about government, I think it's pretty hard for people to always sort out what's exactly at stake at the debates. Um, what we do know is that since these big fights have started over organized labor, over the deficit and cutting the budget, that there's been a pretty broad swing in public sentiments uh, away from the Republican and the conservative position and towards a position that says that there should be more uh, you know, maintenance of protections for the middle class, that we should still try to get the economy going again rather than focusing just on the deficit, and that we shouldn't let these big tax cuts for the rich that are really the defining feature of the last couple decades of American economic policy, that we shouldn't let those continue. Okay, just to set up my next question, I want to read an excerpt from an article in the New York Times from last week, and it goes like this. Jody and Ralph Taylor are public workers whose job as a janitor and a sewer manager cover life's basics. They have moved out of a trailer into a house, do not have to rely on food stamps, and sometimes even splurge for the spicy wing specials at the courtside bar and grill. While that might not seem like much, jobs like theirs with benefits and higher than minimum wages are considered plum in this depressed corner of southern Ohio. Decades of industrial decline have eroded private sector jobs here, leaving a thin crust of low-paying service work that makes public sector jobs look great in comparison. Tell me whether you believe, Jacob, there is a connection between the decline in private sector union membership and the recent struggles of the American middle class. Uh, I, I think there absolutely is a connection. You know, there's two ways in which unions have been on the side of the working and middle classes. First, they've 
unions have often represented workers in the workplace and pushed for better pay and benefits. And it's the case that over the last 20 or 30 years, many of the, the kinds of benefits that people, that workers once took for granted, like a guaranteed pension plan at your place of work or a good health insurance plan, have become much harder to get uh, for private sector workers. And at the same time, wages have been stagnant or even declining for many workers in the middle of the distribution on down. Now, the second thing that we tend to forget is that unions not only worked on behalf of workers within the workplace, but they also worked on behalf of workers in politics. And you know, the, the, the fact is that if you look across countries, that countries that have had stronger labor unions have generally featured less of an increase in this kind of winner-take-all inequality that, that, that my co-author Paul Pearson and I talk about in the book, where the very rich have received such a large share of the gains of economic growth. So unions are a political counterweight as well as an economic counterweight. And, and, and as they've declined dramatically in the United States, from a third of workers or so uh, after World War II uh, to only around a tenth of workers, including the public sector, uh, as unions have declined so dramatically, we've seen also, I think, a decline in the political weight that middle class economic uh, demands and interests get in, in public debate. Well, let me just probe that answer a little more. and and, and I. I, I will follow up on those numbers as well, because based on the income level and education, the middle class in the United States represent, we're told, about 45% of the population. Union membership peaked, as you point out, post-World War II, 1954, I've got here, at about 28% and change. And last year was about 11.9%. So given that union membership represents a relatively small percentage of the middle class, which is already not a majority of the American population, how can unions, or how can you say that unions influence the lives of the broader middle class as dramatically as you just did? Well, first of all, I would say that unions had a big effect beyond their membership when they were at their peak. They, they set the terms of discussion in the private sector about wages and benefits. There's a huge amount of evidence that non-union corporations set their pay and set their benefits in part because they wanted to match uh, unionized companies. But there's another thing to say, which is that Unions explicitly saw their mission at their peak as representing not just those, their members, but also at sort of a, a representing kind of the broader ideals and demands of working class America. So a lot of the gains that unions thought, sought, such as expanding social security program for the aged or um, pushing for civil rights uh, in the 1960s, were gains that they saw as accruing not just to union members, but to, a, to the broader population. So there's that old saying uh, in the United States that the unions are the folks who brought you the weekend. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of truth to that. And that weekend, uh, you know, that idea of there being a 40-hour week that unions pressed for is something that's enjoyed by all middle-class workers, not just those who are members of unions. Okay, again, I'm north of the border, you're south of the border. From up here, we ask questions like this. If unions are so helpful to middle-class people, why is the Tea Party, which is, you know, as far as we can tell, a symptom of significant middle-class anger, so virulently anti-union? It's a good question. And if you look at the Tea Party membership, um, which is older, uh, more likely to be white, um, obviously a lot more conservative than ordinary Americans, uh, it's not as if those folks uh, don't believe in some uh, ideas of, that unions are pressing. For example, most of the Tea Party members were, were galvanized into action in part because they felt like the bailouts of Wall Street and financial institutions went way too far uh, and that it was a giveaway to uh, these rich uh, banks and, and the people who made money in them. And so in that sense, I think unions were one of the key actors pushing for financial reform. The Tea Partiers and unions saw eye to eye on that issue. But I think that there is a reason why there's more of a uh, I don't know, a conflict of interest between members of the Tea Party and unions in the United States. And that is about, is really that got the role of government is really a central issue for the Tea Party. And, the, you know, unions have tended to see government as an ally uh, because government uh, programs and policies were, like Social Security and like Medicare create a kind of floor of protection for American workers. Um, and they've also seen government as an ally, at least up to the 1970s, in protecting uh, people who, who had, who were seeking uh, labor, uh, labor representation from corporate retaliation. Um, but the Tea Party represents a very anti-government movement. And so since the United States not only has uh, this strong 
uh, much stronger public sector unions than private sector unions, and because of this anti-government uh, sentiment, I think it's understandable why the Tea Party members have often been much more anti-union. What we do know is overall that Americans are much more ambivalent towards unions. They're not as hostile as you might think, and, and, and the vast majority, or a substantial majority of Americans, supported the Wisconsin uh, public sector workers when they were struggling to retain their collective bargaining rights. Gotcha. Jacob, thanks so much for joining us on the line from Connecticut tonight. Appreciate your time. It's very much my pleasure. Thank you.